My name is David DeHarder, or if you get formal Dr. David DeHarder, I'm a radiation oncologist and I have recently retired and pursued art. So now I'm a sculptor. Before I was in medicine, uh, I pursued a, a path in, in religion to be a priest and got as far as admission to the, to the Society of Jesus, which is the Jesuit order. In fact, the Pope, who is presently Pope, Pope Francis, he entered the same year as I did in 1959. He entered, uh, I think, the spring of that year, and I entered uh, in August. I was an art collector. My wife and I collected art, very serious art collector, millions of dollars in art, uh, and uh, also a member of different museum boards. Millicent Rogers in Taos, New Mexico, the Sheldon in, in Nebraska, a different uh, museum board. So, so I was in the world of art that way. And uh, we'd uh, get to meet the whole family of art which I, I say the family of art is uh, like the family of oncology. You have the, the cancer nurses, you've got the doctors who are gynecological oncologists, surgical oncologists, medical oncologists, radiation oncologists. It's too big a field for just one person. So the family of art's the same way. You've got in it uh, gallery owners, <laughs> you've got the person who is a critic, uh, the Green, Greenberg kind of critic, uh, very influential in their own way. You have the artist who makes the art, you have the collector who buys the art, the preparator who figures out where to hang it on the museum walls and the gallery walls, and the gallery girl and on and on. He has a big, big family of specialists. So I was in that one up to my neck. Uh, and so I guess uh, what happened was uh, one day I was sitting there uh, paying bills and a lady uh, from the local was patching up some walls that were uh, laid open because of some windows were changed. So uh, she's a faux painter and she makes uh, that part around those windows look the same as all the rest of the room. Um, and uh, I don't know what possessed me, but I asked her, uh, do you think there's anyone in our area who would teach a person uh, sculpture? No. That came out of the blue. Uh, don't know why to this day I would say such a thing. It's completely out of character. Uh, and without even turning around, she said, yes. In fact, we have an excellent person. She said, he's excellent. Uh, I said, did they take a private student? Because I don't want the whole world to know about uh, the fact I can't do squat. If it turns out I can't do squat uh, in this new thing, art. Oh, she said, yes, he'll take a private student, but there's something you need to know about him. He'll fire the student peremptorily, just kick him out his studio. So uh, that got me uh, into sculpture. My excellent uh, mentor and friend, uh, Eduardo, what a wonderful man, just, just a wonderful, and he hadn't fired me yet. The artist, you know, can't ever achieve perfection. In fact, a rule of thumb is perfection is the enemy of good. By pursuing perfection in your art, if you're a novelist, if you're a painter, if you're a sculptor or your work, photography, if you're going to pursue perfection with all your being, you're probably going to screw it up. You're going to go over the top. So you got to know where to draw that line. It is said that medicine is both an art and a science, inasmuch as you wouldn't want a nuclear physicist necessarily treating your gallbladder disease. Uh, there's an art to medicine, and that's like your own art. You learn it as you go along. You can't describe this to someone else and have them step in here and do this. They can't read it in a book and do it. It, science is different. Science, oh, give a big enough whiteboard and you can derive E equals MC squared. I've seen it done. The entire, from, from uh, Sir Isaac Newton, uh, one half MV squared, two E equals MC, it can be done. But take the whole board. And uh, you wouldn't want that guy treating your brain tumor. There's a craft, there's art. And so yeah, it's, it's natural. 
I think it feels, feels natural. There's more heart maybe in medicine. You sure hope so. When the gods created man, remember the lump of clay? So, I mean, it's allegorical. So uh, I could see I was dealing with someone who could help me because he wasn't going to listen to what I said. I was going to listen to what he said. And even though I think you should challenge your teachers, I think you should listen to them. So um, off we went with clay. And I have uh, done a number of clay pieces, fired in the kiln to become a ceramic-like material. It's, it's, it's hard, literally hard as a rock. And uh, lasts forever, maybe. And uh, and you can glaze them or not glaze them, and all kinds of things can be done. But I've also uh, done a lot of things now in bronze. And um, if you want to store about 50 pounds of gold, have them do it in gold. They'll do that too, you know, like for the Vatican. Uh, never tarnish. I've uh, carved in stone. Yeah. Takes forever. Makes you appreciate the David by... Michelangelo. When you make a head in stone and you see that, it just knocks you on your ass. It's such an accomplishment. And again, if I had never done this, it, it would, you know, it doesn't mean that much. Especially in this day and age when we've got a billion images right at our fingertips thanks to Google and so forth, it doesn't mean that much. I started out, I wanted to do this head in granite, and I still do but clay, I love working in clay. And my favorite is terracotta. Terracotta is a red clay and it's got little ground up bits of old terracotta in it too. So it's got kind of a little gritty character. In art, I think just like so many things, if your art is writing, uh, you do well to copy someone else's writing till you found your own voice uh, with art Typically, the students will go to museums and they'll sketch works of art uh, until they get their own. With sculpture, that, that's not that easy. You know, you can't go to the museum and bring your bag of clay with you. So that's a little harder. But I think the principle is probably the same. You start out seeing if you can craft realism. Can you craft a portrait of a person? And then you can go make anything you want. But if you start out making abstractions and anything you want before you can make a portrait of a person, I doubt that's the best way to do it. I think that's missing something big. So I like heads. And I like ethnic heads. Uh, different ages. Uh, I find it fascinating. And I think being uh, medically trained has helped on that sort of thing likely to get the anatomy right, the neck, the head, the shoulders, the arms, and where the hands are, you know, it probably makes it easier for me. Uh, this woman here is to be a middle-aged woman, a sort of Wakanda woman, uh, a warrior woman, and she's poised to stick that big pike in you. A serious look on her face. I don't put a whole lot of clothing on my pieces because I think, you know, there's no bishops around to criticize me for having them the way they occur in nature. So I don't, I don't do that. I love my pieces. I love my art. I thought that a person should be more critical than that. A person should say, there's Picasso and there's Rodin and there's me. No, I like my works. <laughs> well, here's a, here's a humorous one. Here's a humorous one. Here's a fellow laying on his right side. His nose has shifted a little bit to that side, the downside. His eye is what we call proptotic or proptose, or what you'd say in plain English, popped out. You can see his, his eye is popped out. He's got an uncomfortable overall look, and something is rushing out of his poor brain here, his head, I mean, his, his head, and here he's got a big crack in his head. So this is uh, 
Humpty Dumpty, who had a great fall and is kind of allegorical for the way we are in our own lives at some point. At some point, we're going to get to the point that we got the Humpty Dumpty syndrome. That's what we call it medically. It means it doesn't matter if you gather up people from Boston, from Mayo Clinic, from uh, MD Anderson in Houston, from anywhere. Ain't, ain't going to make any difference. You're at that point, Humpty Dumpty syndrome. Nobody can help you. All you can do is keep spending money on the project, keep you on life support, something like that, you know. But, so it's an allegorical piece in a way. I have two favorite uh, pieces here, a drawing and a painting. Uh, first, the drawing. This is one of my very favorite pieces. Just, just a pencil line drawing uh, in the style of Picasso. Uh, we went to a museum uh, in Barcelona and saw some works. Uh, in the old uh, Barri Gotica, the old Gothic burial, and uh, one of them inspired me, so when I got home, I, I do this for myself. And that's another nice thing about being an artist is uh, you don't have to necessarily uh, pay Picasso prices to get something uh, that pleases you like, would a, uh, like a piece of Picasso's work would. Uh, I created that one, that, but this one is uh, Zwei Paaren in the Moonshaft, Vasily Kandinsky's uh, piece, a print, and it's got two peasants uh, in an amorous mood in the moonshaft, in the moonlight. Uh, my new wife and I, we like the moonlight. <laughs> well, the paths to spiritual and physical healing uh, are the subject matter of a million books and self-help books. I think you have to find your own antidote, you know, for what's ailing. If it's loss of a, a spouse after so many years, you know, 55 years, uh, there's no simple answer to it. And while God may help a number of people, he doesn't help everybody. So, um, a person has to believe in himself or herself. If you believe you're worth something and your life is still worth something, uh, then, you know, get out there and get yourself some help. If you're drawn down by drugs or other bad habits, get some help. If you're suicidal because you hate yourself, fundamentally you hate yourself, well, get some help. I mean, that's why God creates all these different people, the psychologists and the psychiatrist and the social worker and, you know, on and on. The VA, you know, if it's a person who's a veteran, saw one too many things over there, uh, whatever it is, uh, get help. There are things worth talking about in, in the Bible. I just give an example. I just happen to have my Bible here. In the book of Ecclesiastes, uh, the last part of Ecclesiastes 1 uh, has some really scary stuff to say. And it's also in tiny print, so scary stuff in tiny print. It says, For in much wisdom is much grief, and he that increaseth knowledge increaseth increaseth sorrow. This is uh, the preacher. Solomon, the great king of Israel, wrote this. And it's a sum of a distillation of all his wisdom. Remember, he had a thousand women. Now, anybody who can keep a thousand women happy, he's one hell of a wise man. We got to concede that. This is the work of the preacher, the son of David, king in Jerusalem, so on and so forth. Vanity of vanities, saith the preacher. Vanity of vanities, all is vanity. Now this is the old language of the King James Version, 1611, so it's like 400 years ago. Uh, vanity just meant it's all superfluous, it's all crap, it's all nothing. Everything is crap. So he is getting a little down on himself at this point and, and uh, proclaimed that everything was pretty much crap. 
and that the more you increase your, your knowledge uh, and your wisdom, uh, the worse life gets for you and the sadder you get. So, I mean, there's some wisdom in that one. And uh, I have toned down my reading in accordance with that. In doing my DNA analysis on myself, uh, I find that uh, I don't have any of the genes known to predict for a long life. So I come up with bupkis when it comes to those long life genes. Yeah. Uh, so I have to be careful. Being a doctor helps on this too, though, because being a doctor, you know a few things. You don't necessarily want to tell everyone about them. They might not know what to do with them, you know. But yeah, you, you, you do know a few things. So maybe I have 10 more years, something like that. Probably not much more than that. Um, just have to use them carefully and wisely and hopefully with joy and happiness. And uh, my new wife and I, we, we just get along great. We have a good time together. We, we have so many things in common. Such a blessing. Thank you.